What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the audiobook slash podcast for Stand Up and Laugh. I am Angelo Gingerelli, stand-up comic and author of the zine Stand Up and Laugh. On this episode, we're going to get even deeper in the top 10 strategies for building a comedy scene, including how to create a presence in the local media, how to work in the, with the community, and how to bring in headliners no matter where you might be. On the other side of the audiobook segment, we have an interview with John Poveromo. He's an actual headliner. He tours all over the country. He's from the Jersey Shore, just like me and just like a lot of other people you've already heard on this podcast, but he's from a little bit of a different generation of comic where he's not the same age or younger than a lot of people already talked to, but he started super early super young and before the explosion of open mics and podcasts and improv groups and things in this area we've talked about a lot already in this podcast he's from the era of going to comedy clubs auditioning getting past and he started that younger than most of the people we've talked to already and most people we will talk to and because of that he's i don't want to say he's further in the game because we had a lot of successful people on this podcast but he's had managers he's had agents he's had representation in the industry and he represents probably more of the traditional "Quote unquote comedy industry than some of the more alternative people we already had on, so I think it's super valuable to get some input and some feedback from someone who's been in the game a long time, been successful, and has that opportunity to leave his local comedy scene and tour and be on big time podcasts and be on big time shows and perform in some legendary venues. So again, on this episode, we're going to talk about more of the top ten strategies for building a comedy scene wherever you might be, and then right after that, we have an interview with John Poveromo. Also, two quick notes on, on the John Paul Romer interview. We did this interview back in 2021, so some of the stuff he talked about, it was a, it got dated because of stuff he was doing that spring and summer, so I went ahead and edited that out because he's just started, moved on to other projects now that those things are kind of irrelevant. And number two, me and him are pretty good friends, and we worked together a lot over the years, so the interview got really long, probably maybe the longest one we've done on this podcast. So some of that got edited to kind of be the most specific that will help you guys out as listeners of Stand Up and Laugh and how he could, he could stick to mainly his journey from wanting to go to comedy clubs and open mics and how he attacked that and how he's seen the New Jersey scene evolve over his time in the game in New Jersey and all throughout the country. Uh, so again, I'm Angelo Gingerelli, author and stand-up comic, and let's get into the top 10 strategies for building a comedy scene, followed immediately by an interview with touring comic John Poveromo. Stand up and laugh. Build a comedy scene, produce your own shows, and create community by Angelo Gingerelli is available now on microcosmpublishing.com. If you're trying to make your way in a world of stand-up comedy, you can build your career while enlivening your local comedy community and mutually supporting your fellow humorists, and you can even have fun while doing it. Angelo Gingerelli shares his hard-won advice for anyone who wants to create a comedy scene from scratch in a smaller community, carve out their unique niche in a larger city full of professional funny people, or anywhere in between. Lots of good tips here for anyone organizing community events from how to book venues, get publicity, and avoid drama. Also includes great arguments for starting or joining a comedy scene rather than thinking of yourself as a lone wolf and solid wisdom for being an asset to an existing stand-up community. Stand Up and Laugh by Angelo Gingerelli is available now on microcosmpublishing.com. Top 10 Strategies for Creating a Local Comedy Scene, Part 2. Number four, create a presence in local media. A million Instagram followers is awesome. Being a Twitter influencer is better than 99% of day jobs, and mediating a thriving Facebook group is a great way to promote your shows. Unfortunately, this kind of social media dominance is not realistic for most comics who are not regularly on television, doing Netflix specials, or hosting blockbuster podcasts. A good way to work your way up the local celebrity ladder is to utilize local media to promote shows and other events in a way that is beneficial to all parties. Most people who cover local arts and entertainment have two main components to their job. First, find out what's happening. And second, let their readers know what's happening. If you are producing comedy events in an emerging scene, you can help these people with both aspects of their job and promote the local scene at the same time. The first step is to find out what social media accounts, community calendars, websites, and other media outlets community members read and respect. This should be relatively easy if you have lived in the area for any length of time. Where did you find out about the first open mic where you performed? Where do you look for weekend events to attend with your friends? What podcast do local artists want to be on? Where did you hear about your favorite local musician? What local writers and photographers have large social media followings? 
The answers to these questions are the first few places you should send your event information for free publicity. Most areas have a few outlets that offer such information, and in areas with thriving arts communities, there may be dozens. It's somewhat important to match the publication with your events, but it's not as important as you may think. Over the years, my comedy career has been covered by hip-hop podcasts and heavy metal magazines, independently published newspapers, and papers owned by worldwide media conglomerates, Instagram accounts dedicated to the performing arts, and Facebook groups dedicated to craft beer. All of these articles and posts have been helpful to both myself and the events I was promoting at the time, and none would have happened if I didn't reach out to outlets not traditionally known for covering stand-up comedy. Once you find the platforms you would like to cover your events, it's best to use a basic database software like Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets of your contact person at each outlet and when you contacted them last. This eliminates looking up their info every time you do a show and contacting them too often in a way that is annoying. Most established publications will have submission guidelines. It's important to follow all of these rules and be professional in your dealings with local media. Having good relationships with the writers, editors, and photographers can have a huge impact on the success or failure of an event. These local tastemakers are the closest things left to traditional, quote, gatekeepers of the past, and having a solid working relationship with them should be a priority. Also, in general, these are solid people who are working to promote the local scene as hard or possibly harder than the actual artist in the scene, so they should be respected and dealt with professionally. Creating a basic press release about the show and sending it to all local media outlets about four to six weeks before the event should be enough to get the ball rolling for local coverage. If you don't hear anything, sending a follow-up email about two weeks later might be a good idea, unless it's specifically stated that no check-in or follow-up emails should be sent. The initial correspondence should have everything necessary for them to promote the show. The date, location, time, lineup, ticket options, everything. The official flyer poster, pictures of the headliner or host performing, and the fact that yourself or people from the lineup are available for interviews. The idea is to make the writer's job as easy as possible and do most of the work for them. If they are deciding which events to include and you have given them all of the necessary information to easily include your event with very little follow-up, you have a much better chance of getting quality coverage. Once you have done a few shows in the area and have formed relationships with these local journalists, the communication can get less formal but should always be professional. Sending press releases with typos, unfinished artwork, or unprofessional emails and DMs is a recipe for disaster for both the immediate event and your long-term relationship with the outlet. Number five, work with the community. Organizations have been using stand-up comedy shows as fundraisers for decades, and the basic model is still pretty relevant today. Generally, a group that needs money, so schools, athletic teams, arts councils, food banks, boys and girls clubs, the list is nearly endless, contracts a producer to put together a show and donates the proceeds to the cause. The producer is paid a flat fee for their work, and the rest of the revenue generated goes to the organization. This fee includes everything the producer needs to put on the show, including paying the comics, but there are a few things that need to be negotiated, like sound, lighting, promotional expenses, and artwork, before the dotted line can be signed by either party. While it's great to help a good cause and nobody should get rich from a, quote, charity show, expenses should be covered and producers and comics should be paid for their work. Three main things to keep in mind when booking and producing fundraisers are being clear about who is responsible for what duties, controlling cost, and matching the lineup to the group. Most of these organizations do not regularly stage comedy shows, so things like audio setup, stage lighting, and online versus door sales for tickets are completely foreign concepts to them. It's best to have a list of policies and procedures of what you need to produce a quality show and make it clear who is responsible for each item what it will cost for you to provide it, and what you need to make it happen. For example, if the stage has house lighting, there's nothing you need to do. But if you're providing the lights, the expense of transporting the lighting has to be factored into the contract. And the time you can have access to the venue to set it up and take it down also has to be explicitly stated. If you can't get into the venue until the door is open for the event and you are setting up a lighting rig when people are finding their seats, the environment is not only unprofessional, but also unsafe. Also, under some circumstances and in certain states, 
and may make sense to establish a limited liability corporation or LLC or other similar business entity to handle income and tax requirements from fundraising events. Laws and tax codes differ from state to state, so it's best to do research the situation in the state where you are doing business and see if this option makes sense for you. Fundraisers are a great way to create states' time and help organizations raise money to accomplish their goals in the local community. Establishing yourself as a quality producer that can help charitable organizations raise funds is a great way to gain notoriety, book more shows, and have a positive impact in your area. Bonus tip. If you want to donate your time and effort to a group or cause that is close to your heart and you can find a group of like-minded comics that will do the show for free and donate any revenue generated, you should absolutely do that. It's a good thing and will definitely help the charity. But keep in mind, if you offer your services free of charge to an organization or event, that will be your established price. And it may be hard to do future business with the same or similar organization in the area if you have set the price for your services at free 90 free. Number six. Bring in headliners. Booking nationally touring comics or even local headliners, which is basically a person with a solid hour of material and a name that sells tickets, is a somewhat risky proposition. There is a much higher cost to book these shows for a few reasons, including the headliner's appearance fee, booking a higher-end room, and marketing a show outside the core comedy community. However, most of the expenses can be offset and a profit can even be turned if the show is well attended, a lot of tickets are sold, and a lot of drinks are bought. The element of risk enters the picture when factors like weather, other shows, unforeseen circumstances, or promotion that doesn't go as planned leaves the producer on the hook for all of the expenses without generating enough revenue to make the show a financial success. Even with this element of risk, it's good to occasionally roll the dice and bring in a comic with a recognizable name to an emerging scene. This gives newer talent the chance to open or host for people that are actually, quote, in the game and gives other comics in the scene a chance to see somebody at the next level up close. Plus, it raises the overall profile of live comedy shows in the area. All of these positives outweigh the financial risk of booking professionals in cities that are off comedy's beaten path. And remember, risk can have reward. You might make a lot of money if things go right. Also, as with all shows, match the headliner to the rest of the lineup and the overall vibe of the scene. Bring in comics you and your friends would want to see. So even if general public ticket sales are slow, the show will be well attended by other comics in the area. Finally, when producers book headliners, other comics in the scene should do everything possible to help the show be successful. Personally, I've hosted a number of weekly open mics over the years that have fallen on nights where other comics were having shows featuring well-known talent. I've always reached out to the producer and worked with them to get the maximum number of people at both shows. I started mics early, ended them late, and let comics with a ticket to the book show get up early at my mic so they could get to the other show in time. This kind of professional courtesy goes a long way in establishing relationships with other comics and producers and growing the entire stand-up comedy scene in the area. The Stand Up and Laugh audiobook slash podcast. It interviews some of the best names in comedy. We're talking about Chris Gethard, Jersey's own, host of New Jersey's The World, host of the Chris Gethard Show, host of the Beautiful Anonymous Podcast. We got Johnny Brennan from the Jerky Boys, a game changer in the 90s, sold millions of albums of prank calls. We got from Arizona, James Petrogallo and Jimmy Wisman, the host of both the Crime and Sports and the Small Town Murder Podcast. From the world of heavy metal, we got Don Jameson. He's been on MTV. He's been on VH1. He's on tour with literally every heavy metal hard rock band you ever heard of. From the Dirty South, we got Manny Garavito and Matthew Hahn. From Jersey again, we got John Paul Rome, one of the finest foreign comics to ever come out of the Jersey Shore. From Cleveland, Ohio, we got Jim Tews. Made a documentary about Cleveland's comedy scene a couple years ago. We've been killing it ever since. We got some of the Jersey Shore's finest comics, including Joe Borzada, Eric Hollerback, and Miles Perduto, all coming to the game from different angles. From Instagram, we got Selena Kopic, the host and the voice behind the NYT Vows Instagram account. And from Comedy Fight Club, we got Matt Marin. The Stand Up and Laugh audiobook slash podcast is available now wherever you listen to podcasts, and Stand Up and Laugh is available right now from microcosmpublishing.com. Welcome back to another interview segment for Stand Up and Laugh, the zine, hopefully book coming from microcosmpublishing.com, available right now wherever you buy books. Got a very special guest on this interview. Um, a lot of what's in the book and the zine focuses on Asbury Park and the Jersey, Jersey Shore from 2013 
to 2020, okay? So this is one of the few people that grew up at the Jersey Shore and was doing comedy and shows and podcasts and writing before 2013. When I kind of arrived on the scene in 2013, he was well-established. He did one of my first comedy on cooking, which you can read about in the book. Um, and it was clear right away, there was a lot of funny people around at that time, but he was definitely, I'm not gonna say funnier to, I don't wanna offend anybody else that did those shows because everybody was great, but he was definitely a, another level of polished and prepared to deal with a crowd and hecklers and, and just the, the professional side of comedy. He was kind of way ahead of everybody else, including myself. So I wanna welcome John Poveromo to the show. John, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for that intro, it was very flattering. Yeah, man, those were good times back in the day. Glad uh, you got to be a part of it. Glad I got to be a part yeah. of it, honestly. Um, let's real quick start with we're, we're from the same town in New Jersey. We um, are. And we're, our, our careers have taken somewhat similar paths, somewhat different. How do you go from, let's say, high school graduation to the, the shows and touring and podcasts and articles you're doing now? So I start, I, I always wanted to be a stand up, I always wanted to do comedy. I went from high school and made the mistake of immediately thinking I was going to be uh, college bound. And I did, I went for about a year and then a lot of stuff happened. You know what I mean? Like I was dating somebody beforehand. One of my best friends had pursued uh, the entertainment, you know, uh, career. She was, uh, um, she just passed away about a year ago, um, but she, uh, she was amazing musician. She was in the Asbury park scene early on too, but um, could play any instrument, could sing amazingly. And she was giving me shit uh, in high school about not, pursuing my dreams basically and she was like you need to come out to LA with me eventually and you need to start doing stand-up yada, yada, yada. and I was like no like the girl I was dating at the time was going off to college all my friends were going to college and I was like no I think I'm gonna do this she's like you're not gonna be happy and I was like no I know I know but you know just I'm gonna do this first and then we'll see what happens afterward and she was like I she's literally like I give it a year and I was like okay and it took a year and I dropped out and started doing stand-up um I took a class. I took a class at Caroline's in New York City because I didn't know you could just go into the city and start doing open mics. I had no idea. And of course, you know, the way we're raised and brought up, everything is schooling. So it seems it still seems safe, even though I dropped out of college and decided not to pursue, you know, what everyone else is doing. Taking a quote unquote class still felt safe. And I did it. My first show was great. Uh, bombed the second show horribly. Um, but from that point on, I was just hooked. Awesome, man. Now about what, what year was that class at Caroline's? When were you? 2000. Doing? I started when I was 20. So 2005. Okay, cool. So kind of right at the beginning of social media, right at the beginning of the yes. internet, the way we know it today. Um, so I was doing mics in the city in 2007, right? Mm -hmm. And even that's when I started and the game was so much different than as far as finding a mic or finding a class at Caroline's. Like now that that information's everywhere, Google gives you a million things you could do. Right. Um, where that stuff just didn't exist in the mid 2000s yet. So we were kind of right on the, I guess I was a little closer to the way it is now, but you really started when you probably had to spend a lot of time looking at, you know, the village voice and all the different weird websites yeah. and stuff to find out what's going on. Where now it's like you follow one good Instagram account and you know, yeah. every comedy thing going on in the tri-state area. Yes. And by the way, I mean, I, I value the class that I had, but I still feel like I should say to anybody listening to you is most of those things are like, you have to go into it understanding that it's, you know, there's a certain percentage of it is a scam. You know what I mean? Like I had 30 people in my class and the only ones that are, that ever can, can you were me and one other woman who she also just passed. I keep losing friends this year. It's insane but um she also just passed away uh but she and i were the only ones who pursued it and did it successfully what i always say i say this in a book a couple of times stuff like classes or bringer shows or things where quote unquote industry is going to be in the house right just tell the truth here's yeah if, if there was a comedy class that advertised itself as if you have some ideas we'll help you work them out at the end of the class when you pay us you got to bring five people and we'll have yeah. a fun night and you'll get some fun pictures i can respect that i can't respect Give us five hundred dollars and we'll make you famous by the end of the month class. Right. I don't. I don't get the lying side of that. You know what I mean? No, me what it is. If I want to do it, I'll do it. If not, I'll, I'll find another way to spend my time and money. Right. That being said, we cover in the book a lot. Twenty thirteen to twenty twenty. What was mm -hmm. going on in Jersey from 05 to say two thousand twelve? When you first started, was there chances to do mics in Jersey? Was there events and venues, or what was going on for you? And your first move was the city. Did you eventually right. start doing shows in Jersey or how'd that work out for you? I did shows everywhere I could. I, I got the chance to do shows. So I lived in New Jersey. I drove into the city all the time. I was, um, so you know where Broadway Comedy Club is New Jersey, in, in New York, right? Yeah. 
okay so that used to be my god i'm gonna sound like an older comic now uh that used to be the improv because bud's wife got it in the divorce and uh i think she was just coked out at the time either way but um she was uh she still owned that club and it was still called the improv and it wasn't it didn't have the same appeal you know as the other the other improvs or whatever but i worked there a lot and i got to do the upstairs room and the downstairs room downstairs room was the main stage upstairs room was for working out material but it it wasn't it didn't have the feel of an open mic because there were still professionals coming in and working out their time upstairs before they went down to do the main room so it was an interesting kind of scene because i still got to see a lot of the people coming in and uh jersey though um we had and i hate to bring up the name but uh we had the one in point pleasant um and then rascals and um god rascals in montclair and rascals in cherry hill those are the two rascals i performed i think that was the first club i performed in new jersey i made a phone call and uh it was like i didn't want to do bringer shows either but i just called clubs and i was like um i can i get a guest spot i'm a new comic i did this this and this show and i and i had people recommend me early on too so like the woman who taught that class took a liking to me a lot she wrote for the rosie o'donnell show back in the day so she was like use my name and she was like a big boston comic so like everybody knew her you know what i mean like she was on all the all the specials back in the day and stuff so she had a good rep and i could call and make those phone calls um and i but i so open mic stuff I didn't do a lot of them. I know there was some bar scene stuff, but I was the guy who called comedy clubs and was like, I'm new. Here's my references. Do you mind if I come to a guest set? How important do you think it is to, to be part of a scene and be around other funny people to kind of sharpen your sword, right? Um, do you think yeah. it's important? To, I got the ex- analogy I use in the book is if it's a playground, if you want to go to basketball, you got to go to the best playground and play with the best players, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think comedy has an element of that? Yes, absolutely. And I like the point that you made in the book too. Um, yeah, I think it is. I think if you hang out with better comics, you'll be better overall. And that's the, da- but that's the dangers of having a scene. You know what I mean? Like I never, um, I didn't hang out too much and I, I wasn't really like a, um, a hangout guy after the show. I, I kind of just kind of did the show, hung around a little bit and then peaced out and went home. Um, and there's a downside to that a little bit, I think. And there's an upside too. It's that it, for me, it was just like, I didn't stay out drinking all night i don't have a bunch of drug stories um you know i didn't get blackout you know drunk and wind up in a jail zone and that i just kind of did my time worked on my material and then and then hung around a little bit and then peaced out um as far as like a scene goes i think you can get caught in that like i love asbury you know we i when i was younger i hung out there all the time i did a bunch of shows in asbury you came along i loved your stuff um, everything that you were doing was was amazing because it was even above it was, your shows were I'm sure we'll get into that more later too but your shows were a step above an open mic it was you handled everything so professionally it just I don't I hope I hope you don't consider your stuff open mic because it was never it, it was another level so um I don't like doing that kind of stuff but like the dangers of hanging around in a scene too much is that you don't develop and you can get you can get comfortable there's a lot of comics that are really comfortable in Asbury I've never seen them anywhere else and I never wanted to be that. You know what I mean? I love I love those scenes, but you have to know when to get out. And you have to know when to break into another one to make yourself better. And it's scary. Mm. When do you decide to leave the tri-state area and start touring and going on the road? And what was that transition like when you went from just Newark, New Jersey to shows in Michigan and Ohio and Georgia? And you know, right. pre-pandemic, you were everywhere. How yes. does that how did that process happen and how did you how did you do it? So that's a, so there's, a, there's a couple different layers to that. So again, when I started out, they were bringer show and we were talking about the scam of the, uh, you know, of taking the class and stuff like that too. Well, you know, just as well as I do, bringer shows are all scam, you know what I mean? And that also makes you not develop as well. It makes you beholden to the system and you don't develop as well as a comedian because when you're doing bringer shows, you're like, I got my 12 friends here. I don't want to bomb because they, they paid a ridiculous amount of money to see me and they can see me on a, a any you know, your folks are there or whatever. And then uh, it's on the top of your head, you're like, I can't try out anything new because now it's too much pressure. I got to be good for this club. I got to be good for these guys. So you don't have the uh, experience of bombing or trying out new material just to have a time. I got lucky. And when I was doing shows at the improv, there was a comedian there. Um, he was headlining, uh, doing a lot of road work. And his name is James Oaks. I'm still friends with him to this day. He's like one of my really good friends. And he took me out on the road with him. I had a car. He had a DUI. <laughs> uh-huh. it was a, it was a match made in heaven 
And then, but he, you know, it was one of those things where like, at, at first it was one of those things where I was like, yeah, he's definitely taking me out because, you know, I got a car. But also there was a million young comics with cars and we just clicked and we liked hanging out and he liked me and we had the same interest in music. So we got on the road together. And I, that experience for me was invaluable because he got me out of the bringer scene. I didn't have to bringer shows. I got to bomb in, you know, um, cat skills in a, in a, in an outdoor farm, you know what I mean? Like whatever it was, but also making decent money and, and getting the experience of being out on the road. And, you know, some nights were good, some nights were bad. And I learned a lot from, you know, I learned a lot about performing in different, um, for different people, for different crowds, so that when I did go back to those other shows, they didn't scare me that much anymore. Not, you know, returning to Caroline's to do a set didn't mean so much because I did it for like 200 Bohians, you know what I mean? Like it didn't matter anymore. Um, and then cut to, um, you know, going out and doing the road and all that other stuff. I started a middle early on and I got kind of, I middled for too long, by the way. Um, everybody has their own pace, but I, I didn't have the aspiration to headline that much. I was still working part-time jobs. Like I, I worked a full-time job when I started um, and, uh, and then went from full-time to part-time and then made most of my money doing stand-up, like evened it out and then middled for like a really long time. Open for good guys. Like I opened for J Jimmy Fallon in 2009 and then we did five shows. And then from that point on, I got to be the guy who like, when the club had a national headliner, he knew I could do it. So I just got to work with great people. And then uh, I was comfort comfortable. We're talking about it before. I got comfortable middling. And I mm -hmm. was like pushed off the headline thing. And then at a certain point, I think like 2015, I was like, I don't want to, I can't do this anymore. It's not financially stable. I need a headline. And I just pushed myself to headline. And then I had a manager by then. And we're just like, let's just book me wherever. And we started, I started working clubs headlining. And the first club I headlined was a club in Virginia called Kazi's. And that was the only club I went MC. When I came back again, I middled. When I came back again, I headlined. So that, that's pretty phenomenal, man. Just working your way right up the ladder. Yeah. And because the, this, this podcast is linked to the zine, in the mm -hmm. longer book that will eventually be published, there's a, a, a big thing about how traditional comedy show works, what a, what a host does, what a middle does, what a feature does, what a headliner does. Just for, for everybody that doesn't, might not know, right? Yeah. How long are we on stage if we're a middle versus a headliner? If you're middling, it's 25 to 30. If you're headlining, headlining it's 45 to 50. Okay, cool. Do you want to clear it up for, for everybody out there? Um, yeah. And that being said, you kind of did the segue on your own and I have to do it. You were able to get a manager from that, that say, year of working your way up to the middle and headlining for, or opening for like Jimmy Fallon. What... What role does outside representation play as far as a manager, an agent, is there a booking agent? And how are you mm. able to make that that work? Because most people that are listening to this and are reading the zine are not at that level yet, but it's everybody's goal to get to that level, right? Yeah. So when do you think it's time to get some representation and what does everybody on the team do? So um, the first manager I had, uh, you know Paul Verzi, right? Not personally, but I'm a fan. Okay, good. So Paul, Paul's a great dude. Um, he got me my first manager. My first manager was his first manager, uh, Tony Camacho. Still having Tony put me in, in colleges. So I had Tony. He hooked me up with some other dude. Um, and then I started doing college shows and, and head, like headlining there and making ridiculous amounts of money doing the college thing. Um, and then, uh, you know, having a manager makes you feel like what you're doing is important. It's just nice to have somebody in your corner. It's, it's um, like psychologically important in the same way that like just paying comics because it just shows you that you respect them, whether it's a decent amount. I think every performer should be paid. I understand that there's people doing open mics and an open mic is a different situation, but I don't care what level you're at. Having gas money at a certain point is important. Just, just letting people know that you value their time and energy that they put into a thing is, uh, is drastically important. So same way with having a manager or somebody in your corner. It's just like, now it just kind of feels like what you're doing means something to someone other than you. And that's, that's really important. Um, having a good one's important too. And knowing when, you know, to let somebody go, you know, if it's not working after a while, it's not working after a while. Um, I, he was my first manager, obviously that didn't work out. And then I went for a few more years without a manager at all. And, uh, and then oddly enough, do you know, Mike O'Keefe? 
Yes, yeah. Okay, Improv Jam. He had me open for one of his shows, and my manager happened to be sitting in the audience at the time, didn't know who he was. I think he was sitting by himself, and I think I actually remember at the time going, who's this creep just sitting by himself? I was like, I was like, there's always a guy who's by himself in the corner. And then, uh, but anyway, yeah, he'd contact me later, and he was like, you're fantastic. Do you want to, you know, do you have a representation? And I was like, no. And he had just come from L.A., um with spotlight entertainment he's like well you know i'm on my own do you want to do you want me to manage you and i was like yeah nice man that's a great story i think i always find it funny with a grown adult men and women in the stand-up world the improv world and like the spoken or poetry world all hit on each other they think the adult, <laughs> i don't i don't they're, number one they're not that much different and number two every time i've opened their dining with an improv group including michael keith's improv jam i've had mm-hmm. a great time yeah, it's been really fun. And you did it the one time, and it turned into a, a, the next step in your career. Yeah, do they reaching out to stuff like that? Particularly if you if you're not like in a, in a big city, makes mm-hmm. sense. Like there's only so, so many people doing that kind of stuff. Why not yeah. work together instead of fighting each other, being immature and having beef with people that you probably don't know? Right. You really, have this. You have the same ideas about the world just because you're a performer and kind of you know you're doing it a little bit different. Yeah. And by the way, that happened in Asbury. It was in the uh, the music store across from. Mm-hmm. The showroom theater. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, uh, Asbury, man. Yeah, man. It's a special place. And we got to be there at a, a, a special time. I think yes. some things are, are changing now between just socioeconomically what's happening and what's happening because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that scene, say, between 10 and 5 and 10 years ago, like that early 2010s, was really cool to be a part of. Um, yes. Cool enough that I wrote a book about it. So it meant obviously yeah. meant to me. Uh, two more questions for you. You do a joke that I absolutely love. And it's, we're from the same town as New Jersey. Yeah. Oh. At the Jersey shore. And the joke is I tell people I'm from Tom's river and they ask where that is. And I reply, drive South out of New York city until you get sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. what, adv- what advice do you have for, let's say a kid graduating high school, 2021 in Tom's river that wants to start comedy and follow in your footsteps. What would you tell your 17, 18 year old self to get to where you are now? Or what's the advice? For so the advice that I would give, I feel like the generic advice that most comics give, and I understand it completely, is like, you know, just get out there, keep working, be funny, you know, like uh, get on stage as much as possible. I agree with all of that. But I think for your own mental health and well-being and career, just keep in mind that no bar or comedy club or comedy club owner has ever made or broken a comic. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. I think when I started out, I held these venues up at a higher standard and like always knew there was a little bit of bullshit but when I started when I was 20 so when you're that young you know like you know you're not sure what's going on and I would just tell somebody like they're going to give you a lot of advice on, on how you should be what you should be um and just be polite say yes and you know and then to do you as long as it's funny no one's going to care and if you don't get to go back to that club doesn't matter because you can hone your craft and get good no matter where you are. It really, it truly doesn't matter where you are. I mean, yeah, I, of course there's like, there's the, there's only five good comedy rooms. You know what I mean? Like really amazing, you know, obviously the comedy seller, uh, comedy, comedy store and comedy seller are like the two meccas of comedy. The improv obviously is just a staple. Um, you know, I, comedy magic club in Hermosa beach is just a very classy place. Um, and then, you know, I, I, can't even i don't know if there was there's probably is a fifth one that i'm forgetting on this list right now maybe laugh factory i don't know but other than that i mean you know the rest of them are good we got good clubs in new jersey ras uh, <laughs> bananas has been around since the 80s stress factory um and uh hmm, that's it and so one of the things i try to hammer home in the book is there's no reason why the bar down the street from your house or a laundry mat or a record store can't be a hot room and let mm-hmm. you and your friends work out material, right? right. The other thing I think is great about where we live, as much as we, you know, we both make fun of Tom's River a lot, you can build this Jersey Shore scene like we have and then mm-hmm. still go to New York or Philadelphia a couple times a week and be part, try to be part of that world at the same time. Yes. If, we were, if we were living in the middle of the Midwest, millions, you know, a thousand miles away from New York or Philly, that's not really possible. We have, right. like this, we have this weird, unfair advantage of people of, we have the the Jersey the the Jersey Shore kind of like punk rock backpack hip hop version of comedy, which is yeah. doing it in very small venues and music venues and and kind of underground. But then the, the real industry, if you will, is is right there, you know, up up the Parkway. Yeah. Um, you gotta, if you're sort of, the, the advice I give a kid from Tom's River would be like exploit that. 
build the scene around you as much as you can and mm-hmm. take one or two nights a week and go to a mic in the city or go to, you know, one yeah. of the contests at Stress Factory and see if what you're practicing every day is actually working at the next level. Yeah. Um, Cause if you lived in, you know, the outskirts of Portland, you probably couldn't do that. Right. Um, I mean, yeah. When you think about it, what, but you're an hour and a half away from New York, you know, you're so close to all those places. I mean, that's why I didn't have really like a, a home club. Like I, when I started, I was in New York all the time. And then I was like, I want to do this room and I want to do that room. And I'm going to call this place. and I'm going to go to Philly. Like, and I think my closest thing I had to a home club was bananas because that they, they were the ones who, you know, let me open for Fallon. And then um, I just, st- I like, if I needed to do time, they let me do time. They were very kind to me. So, but that's an hour and 25 minutes away from me. Right. It's so a, it's a drive. You know, yeah. So the last thing I got, and this was awesome. I thought you dropped a lot of knowledge on people listening. Uh, I think they're really going to enjoy it. Thanks, man. What's your social media and where do we find you online? Oh, God. Please follow me on, at, at, on Instagram. That's where I've built up most of my following. But yeah, Instagram at John Poveromo. All my other stuff is just at John Poveromo. So if you Google my name, it'll pop up. My website's uh, johnpoveromo.net or .com. Uh, 